uh, I've been involved really in pursuing uh, the golden rule, you might say in a simple term, uh, for my lifetime. Built an organization uh, that was highly successful, continues on today. I've been out of that for 12 years. And for the last uh, 15 years, I've been involved in character education. And uh, in the last 12 years, servant leadership, which are institutions and the way communities and institutions are led. Um, I spent about 60% of my time in character education. Uh, no pay, of course. Uh, in Wisconsin, we have a movement of all volunteers. No checkbook, no 501c3. Uh, and we use existing institutions to move the CEP story forward. It's part of the strategy at the national level to decentralize into the states and uh, we are attempting to build a model that other people can learn from. Servant leadership is a worldwide movement. Uh, it's been around for thousands of years. Uh, it, the, the present work comes out of the, the writings of Robert Greenleaf and then uh, many, many, many other authors that are writing off of this material. And most leadership programs in the world at the college level and above uh, incorporate uh, servant leadership. All the armed forces, all the agencies, the government are training with servant leader principles. And basically it's the same as character. Responsibility, respect, listening, humility, uh, foresight. These are the tenets of an organization or a person who is led to serve others. Serve your customers, serve your employees, serve your students, serve, serve your staff serve people within the community. And so that is, it's parallel, and it's the same really as uh, character education. Character education has some principles. Servant leadership is a philosophy. When I first started in business, 21 years old, I said I, I, I didn't see how you could separate your pers personal life from your business life. And in my case, it was faith life from business life. And I was told that uh, Business is business and faith is faith. They don't mix up. I said, how can you possibly have two personalities? And so I, a little bit more blunt than uh, this, but I said, I'll show you. And so I spent the next 50 years building an organization that did just that. Uh, exceptional performance, 93, 96% of the employees in the company, both in union, non-union operations, north and south, uh, all are exactly the same with the golden rule annually. 93 to 96% of our employees would say that, or their employees would say that the company treats them as they would like to be treated and their fellow employees treat them as they would like to be treated. So that's the environment. Now drop that into a school. If you had a school that was that caring and sharing with each other, uh, responsible, uh, you have a different environment. That environment is what allows a uh, school of character. And that character is what allows for successful achievement, caring for the least privileged, and successful lives and virtuous citizens. And our founders uh, said, examined 100 failed city-states, uh, Greek-Roman era, and said, uh, you know, what happened? These were all democracies and all 100 failed. And they concluded that the reason they failed was the lack of virtue. Jefferson Adams debate, they sought the source a virtue was faith, uh, and I think that's still true today, but there's other sources as well. Uh, and so they had the Jefferson Adams debate, the freedom of religion. It sat dormant for quite a few years, and then the government said, we should have public education. And so fortunately, they started off public education with, give us virtuous citizens. That's the only thing we want you to do. And then many years later, the industrial era came along, and they said, you know, we need uh, young people that can read, write, and computate. And then many, many years went by, and all of a sudden, one social program after another after another, all the ills of society was to be taken care of by the schools, and there's actually 51 identified programs they expect schools to handle. And about 20 years ago, the government made a survey nationally, how is civics and citizenship doing? Because that was the evolution of the virtue. And um, the report actually disappeared. I read it, but nobody can find it anymore. It said we're totally defunct. It's not working at all. And of course, we saw it in the marketplace. Uh, and so that began the character education movement. And then a lady uh, 
who's one of the founders of this, said, this is what we need nationally, and then we need a spokesman. That, that was Sandy. They came together uh, with people that are still around today and uh, developed the CEP. And I was interested in character education because I knew that if uh, children had a school uh, where they had a positive environment, that those the least privileged could be lifted up instead of picked on. And so I began with scouting, learning for life, ran into Berkowitz. Berkowitz, uh, I asked him about uh, this data that I had from this Harris poll of kids that were in scouting. And he said it absolutely is valid. And then he did his normal 10 things that are wrong. And I said, well, well, who could do that? He said, nobody's ever done that. He said, why not? He said, well, nobody could afford to do what I just suggested. So this is, was valid data. And I began my journey really with the focus of the least privileged in society, the disadvantaged, for which I had personal experience with a family for 15, 20 years. And there was nothing that I could do to lift them up. But they all went to school until about the ninth grade. And so uh, Marvin actually reeled and reeled for about four years, and I finally came to a form. And then there was political stuff. They wanted big, powerful people. It was one person's view of what should be on the board. And then I think there was a debate, and then finally I came on the board and uh, went through some of the transitions. Some of the executive directors tried to move to a new level, re did the, uh, with others, of course, the, our, our bylaws and removed some officers, put other things in place for a full-time staff operation. Did my maximum time on the board. And then uh, we decentralized the organization, actually uh, encouraged by the Templeton Foundation, but a concept that I believe in, push it down to the lowest level. And uh, you can't run this from Washington, so, but we can. It's a manageable uh, model if we do it from the states. So we sent it to the states, and I said, I'm going to leave my national activity, and I'm going to spend my time in Wisconsin and, and build a model that will be broad and uh, deep uh, that others might learn from, because I think each state is unique. Set of characters, just like each school is unique. They have a particular history. They have uh, professionals that have a particular set of backgrounds, students, members of that community. They're all unique. and so the. The really, really interesting thing about the National Schools of Character is I have not read one National School of Character in the last 18 years that is a blueprint of another one. They are all unique. So it allows, it's not a program, it's a concept with some principles to test that concept. Uh, they build their own. And when you build your own, it's a whole different motivation than when somebody hands you a program to now go teach. And that's what we have in the National Schools of Character. We have a, um, what you could make a case for at the moment. It's going to go away, a toxic environment in education, uh, created by the educators, in my view. They beat themselves up, and they think the rest of the world is actually beating them up when their own members have convinced them the rest of the world is beating them up. And so we're, some don't accept that at all. They go to their classroom when they do their work, or the principal, they run their school. They forget about that. But we have made progress every year, and uh, the progress is, um, in one sense, it's slower because I would like to get to more schools. There's 47,000 teachers, and we haven't gotten to 47,000 teachers. But all 47,000 would say, we do character education. We have a program. I'm busy. I got too much paperwork. I don't have time for anything else. That's the normal response. And then you have those that have a heart, understand this intuitively. And those are the ones that step forward, and we give them scholarships. Uh, there is a state conference, which is very well done. Uh, we have 11 principals training. And if you qualify for one of the promising practices, you win that award, we'll give you a scholarship through 11 principals training, through the state conference. And then the fourth day is coming together as a school and deciding what you're going to do with what you've learned. And then we have LACE. Uh, which is a, a program that uh, came out of Marvin's area, and we've really expanded and made it deeper in my view. Uh, Marvin might argue with that. In fact, I know he would. Um, but we encourage a team from the school to come. And uh, we had full turnout right at the beginning. The number of papers that people write and the attendance that we have 
is the best of any of the LACE programs. Uh, and it's run in a very fine institution that naturally is inclined towards this, Alverno, which is a highly progressive uh, teacher of educators and how to measure outcomes of education. They don't, no grades, no tests. It's what you applied and you're tested on what, what you learned. So they're running our LACE program. And uh, the surprising thing is that we don't have as many schools as like, like I would have liked to have seen, but every year we seem to have a whole school district that's taking this. And I never would have dreamt we could move school districts. We were just focused on schools. Uh, no country in the world, per cap, per person, spends more money than the U.S. So we're not short of money. Uh, we have to rethink education as one uh, progressive union uh, publication. It's not a union publication, but it's put out by people that are members of the union, have been publishing for 20 years. We have to rethink education. And uh, so the ones that are the progressive ones, the collaborators, there's kind of three schools of thought in their view. And the power model doesn't work. That's what's been going on. That doesn't serve kids in the classroom. There's the people that are trying to be in the middle of the road. And then there's the ones that just say, we just have to collaborate with everybody else. That group uh, will find ways. Uh, they've got plenty of money. How can we be more effective? We have an AFS student from our, one of our families does from Germany. And, uh, and she's in the uh, higher end high school. What do they call that? Yeah, I can't think of the name of it right now. But uh, I asked her, how does your high school work? And she said, well, here uh, they come and we have all this school. We go all day long and all afternoon. And then they give us tons of homework to take home. A completely different model. She said, in Germany, uh, we go to school at 8 in the morning. And we finish anywhere from 1 to 2 in the afternoon. The teacher doesn't teach us anything. We get together as teams and we learn together. We have no homework. And of course, German performance is superior to US. So the rethinking is uh, valid. A PhD in nursing, in uh, uh, nursing care for the community, uh, once gave me this information and I think it's absolutely valid. She said, Dick, there's no difference in what goes on in the urban city and what goes on in the rural areas. In the urban city, you see it. In the rural areas, it's often a little shack out in the woods. But she says the same, same things are happening. So the needs are across our society. And we see across our society. When the best and the brightest aren't being virtuous citizens, when they are greedy and their, their mentors are greedy and the deans of their universities are greedy and self-serving, self uh, we have what we now have experienced. Um, the rich get less rich, and the poor get poorer. Uh, and it's not a very rich way to journey. The lives of those people, their children, are not pretty to look at. Um, that's the trade-off. Huge. This is a journey. This organization, CEP, is quite young. Uh, they are putting new vigor into it, getting new board members. Uh, I think they're going in the right direction. How you get there? A national organization takes 40 years to develop. That's the statistical thing. A world organization, I don't, I've never seen any data. Uh, but the world is going in a very positive way. There's a long list of things that have happened in our generation uh, that is just profound. Freedom, I mean, some years ago, um, after World War II, 80% of the land on the earth uh, were not controlled by the people that lived there. Today, more than almost 90% of the Earth's surface, the people that live there have something to say about that. We went through our chaos, the Civil War, nothing bloodier than that, and now other parts of the world are going through their Civil War. So freedom is there, and the goodness of man, of people, uh, there's an intrinsic goodness in everyone. There are some exceptions. But the great majority, you don't even have to speak their language. They, if you respect them, you don't even have to do anything, just in your body language, the way you walk down the street, people will come to your aid, and I know that. I've sailed around the world 20 years, gone into every port, not the tourist route, but a regular route, and I can give you port by port, 
Yemen, all these places. People go out of their way to help you if you respect them. So that same philosophy applies to a school building, a community, a family, a neighbor, a stranger. So all we have to do is keep walking that and we have to keep talking about it. Not about what we've done, but what we've experienced and what we're doing. The example is well understood.